Okay, are you ready for this? So we are on unit two in the interactive notebook flip through. This unit is transformations. It's actually a really short unit. It takes nine days, so it's like two school weeks, which is awesome. I love that we're able to get through this one quickly. So let's just jump right in. We start with um, an introduction to transformations. So we have definitions, transformation, pre-image, image, rigid motion, which is such a weird word. Like I know it's definitely a New York thing. I don't know if it's something that is used really in other areas. We talk about the notation, which is using primes when we do a transformation. And then I show students this image and I ask them to identify the different transformations. And so we come up with the main words of translation, reflection, rotation, and dilation. And I explain to students that dilations are like a separate thing. So we don't cover dilations in the transformations unit. We actually cover that in the similarity unit. So this unit, we're actually just focusing on translations, reflections, and rotations. Basically, your congruence transformations. So we use this unit to develop our definition of congruence, which comes up at the end. So I also have, this particular year, I did a transformations sort. So I gave students some pictures to cut out, and they pasted them down into columns. We have translations, reflections, and rotations so they get to practice identifying them because that's something that is commonly on our state assessment now what i cannot remember like this looks like something i would do one day but i do remember once upon a time that i would also cover translations that first day now i'm like questioning what i did actually um, if you missed the first video of this, this is my interactive notebook from 2019-2020. So that was the last time I did interactive notebooks until this current school year because, you know, pandemic. So now I'm trying to think, like, did I just do the introduction for one whole day? And I might have because students struggle with differentiating between a reflection and a rotation and it's important for them to know because it's like a guaranteed question on our state exam so um just thinking ahead to this year when i get to this unit i will just make this one day this however i may be doing as a um google slides activity instead of making it cut and paste so when students are working on this activity and they're struggling to identify the reflections versus the rotations, I teach them a trick and I reiterate it throughout the unit, but I tell them to draw a line from a point's pre-image to its image. And when they draw those lines, if it's a reflection, every line will be parallel. Like they'll all be parallel to each other. And when it's a rotation, then the lines are not parallel and they often cross or intersect each other. So. Um, I just have them make the lines from pre-image to image and that has been a big help for when students get stuck because there's certain ones like like these ones with the triangles where I purposely made them look the same so they have to like really think about is it a reflection or a rotation. Then we go through and we do like one lesson per day. We have translations. So for translations, I have them focus on writing rules for translations and performing translations. And when I say writing rules, I mean like identifying what was the translation that took place. Then the next day we go on to reflections. So I have them practice identifying the line of reflection. We talk again about making a line from the pre-image to the image, how the line of reflection would be the perpendicular bisector of that line. And later on, I like to make them do a construction of it when we get to constructions, if we have time at the end of the year. Um, and we do a little bit of performing the reflections on the graph. And then I do a little bit of using the special rules. I like to emphasize more like graphing the reflection themselves because it works for everything. Um, and then the special reflections, if they want to memorize these, it's just helpful. When we get to rotations, it's a little bit trickier to graph these. So we actually spend a little bit more time on just identifying the degrees of rotation. We talk about positive 
being counterclockwise and negative being clockwise directions for rotations. I relate it to how the quadrants are numbered, like they're numbered counterclockwise. So I say counterclockwise is considered positive um, so that they can kind of make that connection and it clicks. We do a little bit of practice of like graphing out the rotations, but rotations are just so weird and tricky that when we do it, I stick to 90 degrees, 180, and 270 degree rotations. So that way they can use the special rotations. And we actually develop these as a class together. I'll take a um, coordinate axis on the smart board and just rotate it. And I'll like start turning and say, stop me when I get to 90 degrees. And then we stop and we look at how the x-axis is now the negative y-axis and how what should be the y-axis is x and that's how we get our rules for the special rotations. My favorite is the 180 rotation because it's negative x negative y so I tell them it's like any relationship ever. You start dating someone things are all good happy positive and then something happens where we say oh that person did a 180 where they're not all happy and positive anymore now they're negative. So we got negative x negative y for those 180 degree rotations. So those are our main transformations that we focus on for the unit and then we do symmetry. Now symmetry, I'm kicking myself right now because I remember the reason I waited to do this video was so I could bring home the prop that we use and I left it at school. I didn't even remember to bring it for the video. So you may be seeing me cut into the video with a demonstration. This is what I use for students to discover rotational symmetry. They have shapes. I've added a dot so they know like where they're starting from and they can turn this and the idea is how far do you have to turn the shape pink shape before it fills in that outline of the shape again and that way they're able to find that rectangles have 180 degree rotational symmetry and 360 and then after doing a couple of these they can kind of start to figure out that it's like where this corner points and where that corner points would be your symmetry with the same thing going after the parallelogram we have squares isosceles trapezoids, regular hexagon, a regular pentagon, which is always a tricky one because it's 72 degrees and it's kind of hard to read it exactly. And that's where I get to show them that they can divide five into 360 to figure that out. And then they also get a page with all the shapes on it and that way they're able to take patty paper and sketch them out or trace them rather. And then they can take the patty paper and fold it to discover their line symmetry. So this is a great visual for students that struggle to visualize things like line and rotational symmetry. Some kids, they get it right away and they don't need this, but then other kids, they're really confused and you know they need to be able to visualize it. So they need some kind of a visual aid like this activity to be able to figure it out and understand it. So our notes are just the results of that activity. We keep track of everything on here. And then we just have a couple of practice questions at the end where students can see like what an exam question would look like about symmetry and mainly our exam focuses on the rotational symmetry so before we had our first unit we talked about polygon angle measures and part of it was the exterior angles so we'll relate that first lesson to the symmetry lesson when we talk about rotational symmetry so that would conclude our first week of this unit. It's like we're literally just doing one topic each day. Then the next um, week of this unit, we would be working on sequences of transformations. So we practice identifying the sequence. We practice identifying what a single transformation could look like instead of a sequence, which is kind of a weird one. But it's basically like right here, the directions say state a single transformation that will map the original triangle onto its image. And it's showing a sequence, but it's like, how do we go from the first to the last? And then we have some practice where they are just graphing the sequence of transformations. Then our final topic of this unit is congruence. So we talk about correspondence and congruency and we just talk about it in terms of the rigid motions or congruence transformations. It's all based on reflections, rotations, transformations, nope, translations. So I'm giving them diagrams and they're just determining which angle is congruent to which other angle, which side of a triangle is congruent to which other side of a triangle. And then we just have 
a couple of examples of state exam questions. They really love to say, hey, there was a transformation that happened here. Are these figures congruent? And then the students say, yes, they're congruent because it was a congruence transformation. Um, the phrasing that seems to be like really liked by our state is that angle measure and distance are preserved by whatever transformation it is. So I kind of train my students to say that. Um, and then a lot of times I'll get answers like, they didn't have a dilation. And I'm like, you know what, you're not wrong. So um, that's pretty much this unit. I like that we end it with congruence so that when we pick up unit three, we are picking up just talking about congruence again and more of identifying the corresponding parts. Our next unit is triangles, by the way, and we start out with the proofs. So that is what our second unit of geometry looks like. Um, then we would have a review and then we'd have our test for the unit. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching.